you have your Bibles, would you turn to Daniel, the ninth chapter? I'm going to read verses 24 to 27. And I'll tell you from the outset, this passage is about as clear as mud. It makes no sense. And I've studied it for years, and it's still cloudy. But I think we've got a grasp on it. Daniel 9, beginning in verse 24. God's Word says, Seventy weeks are determined for your people. And for your holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be 70 weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out upon the desolate. May God bless the hearing and the reading of his word. That's a tough one. That's a big old cookie to chew on. But if you understand weeks um, is generally years or increments of years. Uh, And if you go from the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem and then take it, Um, then you understand that it's talking about up to the time of the destruction of the temple around the 69th year after Christ was put to death. Um, In 70 AD, I think it was. Um, The 69th week also, though, confusingly, uh, implies that age when Jesus was physically on earth. Um, So... There's going to be a 70th week, Um, and in that final seven-year period, in the middle of it, is going to come one who is not Christ, the Antichrist, Uh, and he's going to make a covenant with Jerusalem to Israel, to the Jews. This is not written to modern-day Christians. You go back to verse 24, the 70 weeks are determined for your people. That's not the saints, that's the elect, that's Israel. And for your holy city, that's not America, that's Jerusalem. So this is to the Jews. It's for us for understanding and revelation, but it is written to the Jews. So don't make any association or inference that this means the Christians are going to be here for the tribulation. No, we're not. But let's put it into perspective in a way that we can understand, hopefully, as it deals to Israel. Uh, Israel's a small country. Uh, you can walk the length of it uh, in just a few days. From its central mountains to its boundaries, you don't need a camel, you can walk it. It won't take you long. I wouldn't want to do it because we rode by bus when I was over there, but you could. It's not that big. From the Mediterranean on the west to the Jordan River to the east, you can walk that. No problem. But that small little piece of property, 
throughout history, uh, has been repeatedly throughout history fought over and fought over and fought over, and it's not finished yet. There's going to be one final battle over Israel and Jerusalem. Some historians suggest that since 3600 B.C., before Christ, that Israel has only known 292 years of peace. And it's probably accurate. Israel certainly understands that truth. It's been ravaged by, by war. Yet God continues to restore it. It is still, or was when I was there, one of the most beautiful pieces of property on earth. It's God's. It belongs to God. It's a land that's still flowing with milk and honey. Um, and in that, to give you some comparison, if you think about the history and the wars and everything that goes on in the Middle East, and specifically Jerusalem and Israel, by comparison to America, let's bring it home, Israel is seven times smaller than the state of Florida, the whole country. And if you really want to put it in perspective, the country of Israel is slightly less than 10 times larger than Bedford County, Virginia. Yet it remains one of the most contested pieces of property on the planet. Now keep that in mind. Bedford County is a pretty large county and the nation of Israel is right at 10 times the size of Bedford County. So could you walk Bedford County 10 times? Sure, you could. But that's not real big for a nation, is it? It's really small. But let's put it into better perspective. Can you imagine living here in Bedford County and wondering when the next missile is going to land and where you live? The Jews live with that fear every day. And our national media loves to talk about it. Worry that the next missile might land up here on the mountain? Or might land in Manita? Go out ten times. That's still too close for comfort, isn't it? Can you imagine living with that fear? That a missile's coming in and it's going to land somewhere close to where you are? Israel lives with that reality every day. And so Israel wants peace. They long for peace. And I'll tell you this, as this is Veterans Day weekend, uh, and I know the Church of the Brethren is a peace church, but I will tell you this, nobody appreciates peace more than somebody who's seen war and the military and what we see in the military. It's one thing to talk about peace. It's another thing to understand what you're talking about. And I celebrate the Church of the Brethren as a peace church, but nobody appreciates peace more than somebody who's been in the military and seen some of the stuff that we see. In that, Daniel is writing about a coming peace treaty. And bear in mind now, he's put it in perspective, and we've put it in perspective. Imagine living every day, not worried about gas prices or food prices or supply chain interruptions or all this stuff that we're worried about today, but wondering about if your neighborhood's going to get blown up by a missile coming in from Syria or somewhere else or within Israel. Could you imagine? They live with that every day. And so the Bible talks about this coming peace treaty, and it is a warning here of a coming one-week period. One week is seven years in the Bible. So he's talking about a seven-year period. And in that seven-year period are going to be cataclysmic events which will come upon the earth sent by God. That's a hard pill to swallow. But it's judgment. This seven-year period will begin with and will be defined by this coming peace plan for Israel, which will be enabled and then enforced by the coming Antichrist. So let's see what the Bible says about this, that we can understand what it's trying to tell us. Essentially, this prophecy has three parts. The first 69 weeks, if you look again at verse 24, speaking to Israel, Daniel prophesied, 
Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Now, if you use the math, and a week is seven years, and you multiply that times 70, then you get up to 490 years, and you can do all that, but it's really meaningless. The point is to point us to Jesus Christ. God's purpose of the 70 weeks, then, he tells us here, is to finish transgression. What's a transgression? We hear it in church, transgressions, right? What is it? Transgression is simply, in the Greek, just rebellion against God. So anyone or anything that rebels against God, from God's perspective, is a transgression. And it can be applied to anything. Uh, A nation, a people, an individual, an event. If it is against or in rebellion against God, from God's perspective, that action, that thought, is a transgression. Then it says, 70 weeks are given to make an end of sin. What's he talking about there? Is there coming a time where sin will be no more? Yeah. God is going to judge this world. He's going to put an end to sin, and He's going to deal with the father of sin, which is the devil. But in the meantime, the devil's going to play some games. He's going to influence this one called the Antichrist. And He's going to send him trying to destroy God's plan to judge the world. It will also be a time to make reconciliation for iniquity. That's an interesting one. Because what that means in the Greek is to cover up. And in the Greek, it is referring to Jesus' blood shed on the cross for us. So when he says to make reconciliation for iniquity, iniquity is sin, and to make reconciliation for iniquity is God sending His Son, Jesus Christ, from heaven to earth, To be the propitiation for our sins, to live a perfect, sinless life, fully human, fully God. And no, I don't understand that. But he was. And to die on the cross for us that we can be restored to God, released from the bondage of sin, cleansed from sin, and declared right with God. That's reconciliation for iniquity. And Jesus Christ did that on the cross for you and for me. To bring in everlasting righteousness just simply means to restore that normal relationship between God and man that was once had in the Garden of Eden and will return, brothers and sisters, when we get to heaven. The devil can't touch us anymore there. And then he says to seal up the vision and prophecy, which means just to confirm what Daniel was writing, God's going to confirm that. Not that there's no more prophecy which is questionable. We're not in the age of prophets telling us stuff anymore. We're in the age of God fulfilling what the prophets have already said. There's a difference in that when you think about it. It is this part of the prophecy that refers to Jesus Christ. Look again at verse 25. The first 69 weeks is a mathematical prophecy, and I hate math. One of the reasons I don't like this passage. But it's a mathematical prophecy, which began with, the the Bible says, at the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And when did that happen? Well, it happened in Babylon with King Cyrus, who decreed that the Jews could go back and rebuild Jerusalem and their temple. It happened, um, initiated by King Cyrus, but it wasn't until his successor, um, Darius, and um, Artaxerxes, that the Jews really began to go back to Israel. You remember Ezra wrote about that in the Old Testament, um, that he couldn't get a whole bunch of people to go with him. Uh, And the main reason is, we talked about that Monday, uh, Wednesday in Bible study, only about 15% of Jews ever went back to Israel. 85% or so stayed in Babylon. Why? They were comfortable. B, some of them were too old to make the trip. And see, why go? We got everything we need here, three hots and a cot. Let's stay where we are. 
These 69 weeks of verse 25, or 483 years from Artaxerxes' re-decree of what Cyrus had written, takes us exactly to the point on the calendar that Jesus walked or rode that donkey into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. To the day. If you go, you can't go from Cyrus, you have to go from Artaxerxes. And 483 years later, to that day, Jesus rode on a donkey into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. The triumphal entry is what we call it. Circumstance? You think that just happened? Absolutely not. No way. Everything is going according to God's plan. God has everything under control. So that's the first part. The points is to Jesus. The second part of this prophecy deals with that confusing interval between the 69th and the 70th week. And this is absolutely critical. We get the part pointing us to Jesus, but this is the critical part. You see, the revelation of Jesus Christ as the Messiah, sent by God, commissioned by God, and now in that final week on earth, accomplishing his mission to bring salvation to mankind is linked then to the coming day of judgment by God upon this world. And I'll tell you again, don't listen to the people telling you on TV and radio and in little social groups that there's no help. Yes, there is. Don't listen to people telling you God loves you too much to judge you. That's not true. And don't listen to all this love and tolerance stuff. It's a transgression. It goes against what the Word of God says. Don't be a part of it. Or you make yourself liable to be judged for condoning it. And the book of Romans is all about that. Christians aren't supposed to be condoning things that go against the Word of God. Whether we like it emotionally or whatever, we're not supposed to do it. We're supposed to stand with both feet on the Word of God. And America would be a better place today, in my opinion, if we would get busy at doing that. We are so divided over issues that we have lost our sense of mission. And that's a shame. It is intended, it is an act of the devil to distract us. And all you got to do is go around any church group today and you'll hear opinion after opinion after opinion after opinion. And if you disagree with them, then guess who just became the topic of conversation? You. It's sad. And we call ourselves Christians. But all this is linked from the triumphal entry to this day of judgment. And if you remember in Luke 4, when Jesus stood in the synagogue, what book did he read from that time? He read from the book of Isaiah. And that didn't happen by accident. Jesus was handed the book of Messiah, of Isaiah, and he opened the book and he began reading from what we know as the 61st chapter of Isaiah, But he stopped reading at an interesting point. Jesus stopped reading from Isaiah 61 at this. He stopped right before Isaiah continued to say this, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. What's that telling us? Everything's going according to God's plan. God is in control. Jesus didn't read the last part, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of God. Don't think for a minute that God is so loving that God is not going to judge the sinful world. Yes, he is. Read it in the Bible. Stop listening to people with titles who think they know more than God. In that, why would Jesus have stopped reading from Isaiah at that point? The answer is because two statements reveal something about Jesus' role, his mission on earth. In his first advent, Jesus came as Savior, the Lamb of God, to take away the sins of the world. So the day of vengeance of our God in Isaiah, and repeated here by Daniel, simply refers to the second coming of Christ when he puts his feet on earth. And what's he coming for? To judge the world. How anybody can get that God is not going to judge sin or people or the world just doesn't make sense. 
When Jesus comes back to this earth, not the rapture, that's when we go up to him. But when he comes back to this earth, he's coming to take vengeance or revenge on all the transgressions throughout all time up to that point against God. Anybody, anything that has rebelled against God, Jesus is coming to set it straight. And I assure you, you don't want to be in that, counted in that group. Jesus is coming to judge the world. And when he comes, and he comes back to this earth, remember what the Bible says when he comes back? Who comes back with him? We do. Remember the Bible says, and Jesus will be seen riding on a horse and the horseman with him and his army with him. And it talks about as we come back, as he comes back, that the saints come back with him. So there again, you get the idea that if we come back with him in his second coming and there's a gap between the rapture and the judgment of the world, then guys, we can't be in two places at one time. You can't be down here going through the tribulation and having been raptured to God in heaven and come back with him at the second coming. So you're not going through this. There's a pre-tribulation rapture that is biblical. The mid and post is not biblical. Based primarily on a misunderstanding of the word elect. And specifically for Matthew 24. But in that, Jesus is coming back to judge all people in rebellion against God. And the primary way people get in rebellion or get into that court of transgression or rebellion against God is to not believe in Jesus Christ, to think it's silly or don't make sense or I ain't got time for that. Or worse yet, the most common, I think, today is, well, I've got my life planned out. Who I'm going to marry, how many kids I'm going to have, what job I'm going to have, what education I'm going to have, how much money I'm going to make, what I'm going to spend it on. And all of a sudden, we realize... We're so focused on ourselves, we can't be focused on Jesus Christ and what he wants us to do. So we stop listening to what God wants us to do and we start going after our own plans. It's a transgression. It's okay to have your own plans, but just make sure they're in line with what Jesus and God wants you to do and what he's equipped you to do. You see, between the 69th and 70 weeks of Daniel's prophecies, three things must happen. Look again at verse 26. Three things that got to happen in that span between the 69th and 70th week. One thing that has to happen and has happened in that gap is Jesus Christ, our Messiah, see where it says, will be cut off. What's it referring to? You know the answer to this. When he was hung on the cross, he was cut off. So that's the first thing. That's already happened. The second thing that will happen in that span between 69th and 70th week is the temple would be destroyed. And it was. In the year 70, after the death of our Lord, Rome destroyed it. So that's happened. The third event then that the Bible says has to happen before God sends Jesus to judge the world, is there has to be a peace treaty established in Israel, for Israel, but not by God, by the devil. So at some point in the future, this person who will come under the influence of Satan, who we know is the Antichrist, will negotiate a peace treaty with Israel, and that will begin a seven-year treaty. And in the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy begins then with that point in time. And we're not there yet, but we're coming close. The Bible's clear the final seven-year period will be divided into two three-and-a-half-year periods in which during the first part, and here again, we go with, be careful who you listen to. If in the first part, Israel will worship again and make sacrifices in the temple, doesn't the temple have to, have to be there? The answer is yes. 
So yes, there will be a real rebuilt temple on that 40 acres north of the Dome of the Rock. That's yet to happen. Israel will worship God there. They will make sacrifice. And the Temple Institute in Jerusalem is already making the priestly garments today. They are making all the vessels. They are making everything according to Exodus so that when the temple's rebuilt, it's ready to go. So don't think it's some 20, 30, 40, 50 years, 100 years away. It could be tomorrow. They're making these things today. The only thing that's throwing them a curveball is the, um, is it the menorah, the seven candles, that the oil flows through. The biblical description, we don't have the technology day to make that according to the, what is given to us, the instructions in Exodus. So we're not sure how we're going to make that. But then again, you can't make it by human mind and reasoning because it requires divine revelation and inspiration. So when the time is right, God's going to inspire these Jews to make it. And then everything's ready to go. The last three years or three and a half years are going to be a time filled with unimaginable horrors as the Antichrist, inspired by the devil, seeks to destroy all that is God. And again, what is that? Well, that's rebellion. What is rebellion? Rebellion is transgressions. Jesus said in Matthew 24, those final three and a half years will be like has never been seen in the history of mankind. So should we take this serious? Yes. Should we take serious whether or not we choose to believe in Jesus Christ or think we've got the rest of our life to make a decision? And worse yet, to think that somehow we're going to be in control of our death and we'll just make that declaration on our deathbed. What if you never make it to your deathbed? See the horror in making plans to do against what God is calling you to do? It's going to be such a terrible time that the Bible says unless God shortened it to three and a half years, nobody and nothing would survive. Revelation chapter 16 mentions seven bowls of God's wrath, not his love. So there we go again. That will be poured out upon mankind on earth during those three and a half years. Who's going to be there? Anybody and everybody who down deep in their heart really does not believe in Jesus Christ. Made a profession, but didn't believe it. You're going to be here. Put off making a decision for Jesus Christ, you're going to be here. Anybody who rejected Jesus Christ, you're going to be here for that unless you come to faith in Jesus Christ. That's enough of bad news, right? We're upbeat, positive people. And I am, so let's have some good news. Here's some good news for you. God will send Jesus Christ to rescue the saints before the seven years ever happens. It's called the rapture. Brothers and sisters, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you've professed him, believe in all your heart that God sent him, that he died on the cross for you, and God said, hey, son, get up. It's time to come home. And he went back to heaven. Guess what? If you believe that with all your heart, you're not going to be here for this. You're going to be raptured. That's good news. The coming day of God's vengeance will come as a thief in the night, which means everybody's not going to see it. Then assures believers in Jesus Christ of this. It's written in the scripture. Quote, God did not appoint us to wrath. So if God did not appoint us to wrath, will we be here of the day of wrath? No. Because God hasn't set that for us. He's removed us from that. Then it goes on to say, but to obtain salvation through who? Our doctrine, our belief, our church, what grandma taught us? No, through Jesus Christ. Who died for us, that whether we wake, which means live, or whether we sleep, which means to have passed on, we should live together with him. There's a coming rapture, and it's coming sooner than we think. And we're going to be with him forever. We're going to be with each other. So if this message has scared you, and I really hope it hasn't, then, and you've put off coming to Jesus Christ in faith, but realize you don't want to be around for that 70th week, then come to Jesus in faith. Salvation is so simple. Just receive Jesus Christ in your heart. Believe that he died for your sin and rose again. And if you truly believe that, I don't save you, and no pastor does. God saves you through his son, Jesus Christ. And you will be assured that someday you will rise with him forever and escape the coming tribulation. For those of you who are saved through God's grace in Jesus Christ, the message to us is not panic. It's watch. 
you were in a Bible-believing, Jesus-professing, repentance, preaching church where you can learn the Bible prophecies and truth which will give you insight into God's unfolding plan. And I assure you, everything is going right according to God's plan. Why? Who's in control? God. And in God's unfolding plan, my friends, you have a place with Jesus Christ. And you have a place in it through God's love for you and Christ's sacrifice on the cross for you. So it's a good day to be a Christian. Amen? Amen. Please stand as you're able for our closing hymn number... What to do with it? 320, I want to offer an invitation to you. If you're in your car in a fellowship hall or here in this room, you've never really received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I invite you to come forward as we sing number 320. If you'd just like to join with our church, we'd love to have you. Number 320. Thank you for being here with us today. I hope that this message has maybe um, taught you something, opened your eyes to the reality that we're to take salvation in Jesus Christ very seriously. Uh, and there's no better time now than to come to him. I encourage you to stick around for the council meeting uh, of the work that's going on in the church. There's tremendous work going on in your church. Uh, people have been hard at work. Uh, and we find ourselves in a time where uh, we've got to toughen our skin just a little bit, but God has a plan, and he'll see us through if we're faithful to him. In that, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Go in peace. Amen.